So yeah, I'm Ed, I'm Ed Friedman. Welcome everybody to this this uh, hopefully wonderful evening. I know it will be a wonderful evening um, in our 25th year of our of our speaker series. Um, I want to thank Martha, who's who's online here, and and Martha Spies and Arthur Spies for helping out with the Zoom part of this, and Peace Action Maine actually for being a part of it, um, and our, our web volunteer dealing with the um, the product that we'll get out of this, Martin McDonough. Um, so this is again our 25th year of, of having a speaker series. Um, uh, we, as, as some of you know, are a unique organization in that we take a very holistic look at uh, Mary Meaning Bay and, and uh, the environment in general. And we do that through research, we do it through advocacy, uh, which is strongly informed by our research. Uh, we are a land trust and we, um, we uh, have an active education program as well. Um, so Ed, are you are you advancing the slides? There yeah, are. I, I am now. Sorry. Yeah. So yes. Yeah, so research. Um, um, some examples here. Some of the things we've done. A, a really unique circulation study of the bay over a bunch of years, um, which is available in animated form on our website. Um, we have done quite a bit of archaeology over the years um, with the Maine Historic Preservation Commission on land we've protected. Uh, unique project using caged freshwater mussels to see whether pulp mills were still discharging dioxin and see if we could locate the PCB hotspot in the Kennebec River, which is responsible in large part for fish consumption advisories. And uh, we'll move right along. Again, research informing our advocacy. Um, so a lot of our work's been around uh, fish passage and trying to uh, eliminate turbine mortality or uh, fish mortality in general, whether they can't get up river or they uh, can't get down river. And that slide in the upper left is a um, probably a 25 year old female American eel that was uh, killed by that a turbine in the dam just above her there. And uh, so, and obviously then this other smaller fish, an alewife that was decapitated uh, by the turbines down in Brunswick. So, education uh, has been hit hardest by COVID, but we actually did have a very successful couple of programs last year over a couple of the elementary schools program that got them involved in threats to pollinators. Uh, program was to be or not to be. Um, so our bay days have been on hold, in-class visits have been on hold because of COVID. And we've protected now over 1,500 acres of land around the bay, predominantly um, high value wildlife habitat. That is our focus as opposed to lands with trails and so forth uh, as some of the other land trusts do. So working on three conservation easements right now. If you have friends that want to see this program that couldn't make it tonight, if you go to the homepage of our website, friendsofmerrymeanybay.org or f1b.org, um, go down the right side under education, and you'll see a, a speaker series videos uh, list here. And you can click on that and go to the year, and you'll see a copy of the press release for this event. And then down at the bottom, the YouTube recording of it. This is what the rest of the year looks like. Um, next event is with Nate Gray, one of our board members and a longtime biologist with the Department of Marine Fish, uh, Department of uh, Marine Resources on American Shad, uh, which for got a little boost to their fame from the well-known author John McPhee, who wrote a wonderful book called The Founding Fish, and uh, so-called Founding Fish probably because, according to um, oh I don't know if it's legend or fact. Uh, George Washington's uh, winter bound troops at Valley Forge would not have gotten through that winter without shad to eat from the Susquehanna River. So, and then we're going to have a to be or not to be as well at the end. So, moving on to tonight, our speaker, um, Mark Beckoff. Um, I talked, started talking to Mark probably three years ago about being a speaker for us, maybe even longer than that, because of his work with animal, uh, animal emotions. And uh, Mark lives out in Colorado, out in Boulder. And, you know, it's pretty rare that he gets to the East Coast. And we we're hoping to maybe coordinate something where we could plug him into a speaker series uh, when he was on a trip East. And that didn't happen. So 
this is um, one thing we have uh, COVID to be thankful for, having Mark here tonight. Um, and uh, so he's joining us via Zoom. He's got a very busy schedule, but we're so glad to have him finally. Um, he is a professor emeritus of ecology and evolutionary biology at the University of Colorado in Boulder. He's published 31 books or so. He's won many awards for his research on animal behavior, animal emotions, um, also called cognitive ethology. He's done a lot of work with compassionate conservation and animal protection. He's worked closely with Jane Goodall, a former Guggenheim fellow, and he um, works with the Boulder County Jail. His most recent book is Unleashing Your Dog. Um, nope, sorry, wrong book. A Dog's World, Imagining the Lives of Dog in a World Without Humans. It was just published last fall. Um, he's a great biker. It's probably why he's getting hip redone. Uh, and in 1986, won the master's uh, grade Tour de France. Let me just mention a few um, other things here. Um, uh, Mark and Jane, Jane Goodall co-founded the organization Ethologists for the Ethical Treatment of Animals, Citizens for Responsible Animal Behavior Studies in 2000. Um, he's on the board of directors of the Cougar Fund, an advisory board for defenders, animal defenders and Project Coyote. Um, I like the fact, Mark, that you were presented with the St. Francis of Assisi Award uh, by the ALCA New Zealand SPCA. And... Um, uh, there's a summary of Mark's work called The Emotional Lives of Animals. A leading scientist explores animal joy, sorrow, and empathy, and why they matter. It's published in 2007. Um, and uh, a book, Animal, uh, Animals Matter, biologist explains why we should treat animals with compassion and respect. Uh, published in 2007 as well. And... Um, Ignoring Nature No More, The Case for Compassion and Conservation, and a collection of essays in psychology today called Why Dogs Hump and Bees Get Depressed. So um, these are all reasons why I'd hope to have Mark here a while ago and why we're so happy to have you here tonight, Mark. And with that, I'm going to let you take over and uh, I will stop sharing my screen and you can do yours. Ed, can you mention about the questions at the end? I can, yes. Uh, sorry about that. Thank you. Um, yeah, we, we can take questions um, uh, during the program, but uh, send them to the chat room. And what we'll do is have Martha kind of curate them uh, at the end. But Mark is happy to answer uh, you know, as many questions as he, as he can uh, towards the end there. So now we'll take it away, Mark. Oh, great. Thanks, Ed. And um, thank you all for joining. Um, that's my view from my couch, but it's snowing here and I'm, I'm anti-snow right now. Um, but anyway, thanks for joining. Thought what I would do is I've got a bunch of notes here. Um, really my concerns in the study of dogs has been how mass media, mass media, as well as some researchers, I suppose, misrepresent dogs for who they are and, um, mislabel their behaviors. And so one of the things I want to do is just go through a list of myths about dog behavior and dispel them um, fairly rapidly. Um, a couple of the main messages is that there's no universal dog. And a little known fact by most people is that of the billion or so dogs in the world, only about 25% of them are actually homed. Um, the rest are free ranging and feral free ranging dogs might have some contact with humans, but not as regular as what we would, um, who we might call, um, a homed dog. So a lot of general generalizations that people offer about dog behavior are based on a really small subset of dogs on, um, this planet. And Jessica Pierce in my new book called A Dog's World, Imagining the Lives of Dogs in a World Without Humans, really enters the scene here um, because surprisingly, a lot of dogs would do very well without us. Um, I, I'm not surprised by it, but a lot of people are. So um, having said that, I think what I'll do is I'll just start going through a list of myths. Um, and make a summary. And then I'm really open to hearing questions from y'all because that's how I learn. 
Um, so if you're ready, then one myth that I've already mentioned is that there, there's no universal do dog or prototype dog. Um, there's lots of variation. In fact, dogs are probably among the most diverse group of carnivores because dogs are carnivores um, um, that exist. Um, and so trying to normalize their behavior is really dangerous because people are often looking for easy answers of why dogs did this or that or the other thing. And it really comes down to the personal experience and the personality of each individual dog. Another myth is that dogs are our best friends. I mean, there's books titled, you know, how to, how to live with your best friend or dogs are your best friend. And that's another myth. I mean, dog abuse is rampant globally. I was just writing, I'm writing a new book and I was looking at some of the data today and it's really scary in many ways. Um, the extent of dog abuse and when I'm not only talking here about the abuse that's really obvious, you know, like chaining a dog out when it's below zero or keeping them in a car when it's 115 degrees um, or, you know, treating them, beating, hitting them to train them, which is totally wrong or, you know, harming them in any way. Um, but the lives of a lot of home dogs are pretty horrible too. And they border on abusive people get a dog. They don't know what they're doing with it. It's been particularly rampant during the pandemic. So they leave them home. They take them on a walk. Then they put them in a crate and they leave them home all day or leave them in um, a small room. And that's abusive too. Um, because I don't mean it in a negative way, but when you look at dogs as captive individuals, um, that's who they are. That's who they are. We tell them, you know, when they can eat, what they can eat, where they can eat, when they can pee and poop and play and with whom they can play, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I think we just need to remember that a small percentage of dogs on earth have this sort of home and drawing generalizations from studies on homed dogs in, in laboratories, for example, can be very misleading. It's, it's not a criticism of the science. It's more a criticism of the fact that these dogs basically only represent themselves. Um, another myth is that dogs are unconditional lovers, which, which is so false, it's frightening. I mean, if you've ever adopted or fostered a dog who's been abused um, early in life, you know that they're very picky and they're very it's very difficult to get them to bond often with a human being. Um, so once again, I think it serves us well when we say dogs are unconditional lovers because so many people will say, well, I can lock my dog in, the, in a broom closet all day and they'll come out wagging their tail. But that of course doesn't mean that they love you. I mean, they might be happy to see you for all the wrong reasons. Um, so that's another myth that we read about a lot that I think really needs to be um, dealt with clearly and dispelled. Continuing on, um, a lot of people feel that dogs only need food and a warm, safe bed and a place to rest in veterinary care. Dogs need love. Um, food is not a substitute for love. They need to feel wanted, um, maybe feel needed, and really feel safe and secure in any relationship with um, a human being. Another myth that enters the scene a lot is that dogs don't display dominance, but of course they display dominance. All, just about all animals who have been studied form dominance relationships, but this doesn't mean that we should dominate them. And that's where I learned early on in my career that this ridiculous statement that dogs don't form dominance relationships among themselves um, really originated because people were afraid that, you know, others, I mean, you would hope a few people would say, well, they dominate one another, so it's okay for us to dominate them, you know, like a season Milan type training or using shock collars or something like that. So dogs do display dominance, 
Um, it's really debatable whether we're, um, you know, whether they consider themselves to be members of our of a family, and it's you know very debatable whether you know, they look at us as a member of their pack. You know, you read that all the time too, that, well, we're just members of the pack and we can be the alpha member of the group. And, you know, once again, I don't know, I don't know what that really means. I mean, we're not dogs and they're not humans, but you read that a lot. Um, another, you know, myth is that dogs live in the present. You know, there's websites called, you know, Zen dog and things like that. And of course they don't. I mean, once again, if you've ever dealt with a dog who's had a horrible upbringing, you know, the past influences them just as it would influence us. And there's a lot of future thinking. I mean, I, I, I mean, one example, watch a dog chase, it, uh, you know, uh, follow a Frisbee in the air, um, watch a dog look at us and then jump off the couch knowing that, oh, you know, Ed or Mark moved in a certain way and I'm going for a walk. Um, and some people say, well, that's just conditioned. And well, sometimes it might be, but all the things that dogs do and anticipate or expect are hardly conditioned. And, and once again, it's, it short circuits the dogs for having a very rich life in which whatever happened in the past influences them at a particular moment and that they don't have future thoughts. So they're not locked in the present at all. Um, another one that I read about a couple of years ago from an article was that dogs don't like to be hugged. And I mean, that's just ridiculous. Some dogs like it and some dogs don't. So if you know a dog likes it, then do it, you know, to your heart's content. If you know a dog doesn't like, like being hugged, which is part of, of course, the sensation of being touched, then don't hug them. I mean, I, I mean, to me, it's not rocket science. It's just, once again, taking into account the fact that they're individuals, just like some people don't like to be hugged, so you don't hug them. And if they like to be hugged, you can just hug them um, all you want. Another is that dogs shouldn't sleep in bedrooms or beds. And, and, and once again, I find, I find that to be really silly. Um, if you don't mind their presence and they like it, then... It's, it's well and good, but there have been popular articles that say that we should not allow dogs to sleep in our bedroom or beds. And one of them used an example of young dogs who might keep you up or old dogs who are ill who might keep you up. Well, I mean, they're the very dogs who need our contact. Young dogs need a lot of human contact uh, and to become socialized. Um, you know, say to become card carrying dogs, as I like to call them. <clears throat> and old dogs can get ill. And after I wrote an essay on this, I had a good number of emails. It's, you know, went something like, oh, gosh, you know, my old dog wouldn't be with me today if they didn't have access or didn't sleep next to the bed because they got sick during the night and had to rush them to um, the veterinarian. Giving dogs as gifts some humane societies advocate this, but once again, I think that it's ridiculous to give a dog as a gift unless, unless you've talked to the person and it's, and it's an anticipated gift. I mean, getting, bringing a dog into your home and hopefully into your heart is a life changer. And I'm sure I'm preaching to the converted with a lot of you all who have done this. But it's a life changer in terms of your daily rhythms, in terms of the expenses that you might incur, and just the responsibility <clears throat> of giving the best life you can to a clearly sentient emotional being. So giving dogs as a gift without really talking about um, the possibility of it to the people is really, uh, I think it's totally wrong-minded. And then people say, well, then it wouldn't really be, you know, a gift. And I'm saying, well, it could be a gift, but at least you're not using a dog in a pawn, yeah, as a pawn. And well, maybe the people won't like it, so they'll abandon them. And as you know, probably if you, you know, but I don't know that you all read news about dogs, um, you know, the, the giving up rate, you know, the abandonment rate by people of post, uh, post-pandemic, post-pandemically or dogs who were gotten during the pandemic is frightfully high. And so the dog pays the price, if you will, 
for either being given as a gift or for um, not for, or for a person making that decision because it's good for them, but not necessarily for the dog. I mean, the bottom line here is that when we enter into a relationship with a dog and or other companion animals, it's got to be, you know, a give and take, a mutually tolerated relationship. And then it's a win-win for all. Um, just a few more um, some people suggest that we don't allow dogs to play tug of war with us because it's an ability, it's an, it's an attempt to dominate us. But, but once again, I mean, that's just silly. They enjoy it. And I don't, and I've, I've really, I, I was shocked to read this actually that, you know, we shouldn't let them do it because if they win, then they're going to try to dominate us. And the other one of course, is that dogs, if we let dogs go out the door before us, that establishes them as being a dominant individual, um, which, it, which once again is, I mean, it's just really silly to me. Um, and the last one is simply that dog parks are bad. Um, dog parks I visited in, during my life, which have been countless, 99% have been good. Yeah, there can be dog parks that aren't good or good meaning that, you know, maybe people don't watch their dogs, but it's a people problem, which becomes a, a dog park problem. But once again, if a dog likes to go to a dog park, then bring them to the dog park. And if they don't like it, but you like it, then go alone. I mean, I used to go alone a lot to dog parks so I can just sort of hang out and watch dogs <clears throat> and see what they're doing. So, I mean, those are among the myths. And and they really do play a large role in a lot of literature um, on dogs, um, especially in the training literature, which allows people to justify using like electronic shock collars or to hit dogs um, or swat them or something like that. I mean, I'm a total fan of positive force-free dog training. And when I've talked to trainers about this, and I've mentioned some quote success cases where people have shocked them or, or use a little too much physical force. Invariably, they've come back with alternative solutions for training or teaching the dog to do what you would like them to do and actually get the dog to do what you would like them to do. And they eventually come to do what they like to do because dogs really like to please us. It doesn't mean they're in the market to please us all the time, regardless of how we treat them. Um, so those are pretty much the myths. Um, some key points that I want to put out, and you know, then I would hope there's questions I could keep on talking, is um, one key point is that oversimplified explanations of what makes dogs tick are very misleading. And dogs often pay the price for these misunderstandings. Um, I have people say, well, I read that my dog should do this or my dog should love me or my dog shouldn't do something. And what's wrong with the dog? And oftentimes I say, well, it's not a necessarily it's not necessarily what's wrong with the dog. There's something maybe wrong with the relationship you have with them, not blaming it on the dog um, or the human. And another important thing is like the importance of looking at context, you know, when a dog does something or, <clears throat> or doesn't do something because they don't feel comfortable. I mean, one, of, one example, of course, is humping. You know, people think that humping is always sort of some kind of reproductive or sexually motivated behavior. It's not at all. I mean, I've seen it runs wild, if you will, in wild wolves and coyotes. It could be part of the courtship sequence. It could be part of mating, but it also could be um, not necessarily an expression of dominance, but it's playful. Um, you know, maybe we've all seen dogs just running around and jump on another dog and in some orientation, just start humping. And so it's not necessarily reproductive. It's not necessarily vulgar and it's entirely dog appropriate um, on a number of occasions, just like barking, people will go, well, my dog barks too much, but my dog barks excessively. 
And I'll say, well, what about what, what's the context of this? What are they trying to tell you? Um, I'm, I, I usually say that most dogs don't bark too much or excessively. They're barking because there's something wrong in their lives. Their brains are processing something and that's not working for them. So that would be, you know, another myth that they bark to disturb us. Um, I don't think that's necessarily true. They may bark to get our attention, but that means that maybe they want our attention because there's something awry and they don't, um, and then, and they don't feel safe. Um, another bottom line is if a person chooses to get a dog, they need to become fluent in dog or dog literate, especially for first time, if you will, dog guardians. Um, because if you know what a dog is doing and you look at context and you learn to read their facial expressions, their ear positions, their tail positions, their gait, their body position, whether they're squinting, whether they're cocking their head and how these all can move with one another, then we can learn a lot more about the subtle messages um, that they're trying to send us. So um, yeah, I, I just don't know. I, I could keep on going. I don't know if there are any questions. Um, about some of the things I've said. Well, I have, I have a couple of questions, Mark. And okay, then good. Open it up to um, chat people. <clears throat> but historically, you know, obviously we have bred all these different dog breeds and we've trained dogs for a multitude of tasks, purposes. Um, a lot of that training has been hard on mm -hmm. the dog. Some of it's been soft. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know that I've trained retrievers. I know there's at least one other person on, on the call who's done that. Um, you know, I, I have I have used a shock collar to get the attention of a dog at a, at a great distance. Mm -hmm. never, never, never used it anything I wouldn't shock myself with. I've sure. um, so uh, curious on your take on the whole history of breeding and training is one question. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing is based on a lot of what you've been saying, you you could really be describing raising a child or being with another person. And would you go so far as to say uh, canines are furry people? And, uh, and then when you're, when you're done with those two, uh, how, do, how do canines differ from felines? Because I suspect there's probably a pretty good difference. Yeah, I wouldn't say that dogs are furry people. They're sentient emotional beings. So because they're alive and they're feeling beings, they should be treated with a total respect and compassion. Um, like I said, I knew of when I lived in the mountains in, in, outside of Boulder, one of my neighbors used a shock collar on a puppy she got who kept running away. And we really needed to watch the dogs there because we had black bears and cougars and bobcats and coyotes and foxes. I mean, literally living around our houses. So she got a shock collar. She put it on. She tested it on herself. She shocked. She gave the dog a zap once. And as far as I know, the dog never ran away again. Mm -hmm. I had not, I didn't have much of a problem with that until I talked to some trainers who also had success in, in, in a similar situation. Um, without using any kind of aversive um, um, stimulus, if you will, like a shock collar at all. So I always say I'm not a dog trainer and, I, and I've had to call dog trainers to help me with some problem dogs, especially dogs who I rescued and I didn't really know much about their own uh, history. Um, so so I've, I've basically come to the position where I, I would like to see shock collar is not used based on a lot of the information I get from trainers. Um, as far as dogs and cats are concerned, I've been writing a lot about this. I love cats, but I'm allergic to most of them. So I don't, I've never really gotten close to a cat, although I really like them. I, I babysit one of my neighbor's cats and I put a mask on and I put gloves on and I rub her belly with a long stick, but I still, after five minutes can't breathe and my eyes are running. Um, but slowly but surely we're learning though, it's just a myth 
that cats are necessarily less social than dogs, are not quote as smart as dogs, are not as socially aware as dogs. And so I just really say to people that the research I know and the people I talk to who are quote cat people make it really clear that the differences between dogs and cats are certainly not as large as a lot of people make them out to be. But I also know from talking to cat trainers, some of whom are dog trainers as well, but I also know from talking to them that a lot of people get a cat because they think that the cat doesn't need as much care. I mean, I've met people who leave their home for five days and leave food and water for the cat, and that's it. And when they ask me what I think, I tell them that I think it's wrong, and I think it's really not respecting who the cat is. Um, and I, that's all I can say. So there's been some very old studies of cats, many of which were published in German back 30, 40, 50 years ago that show this too. But unfortunately, the people don't read the language and didn't, don't know about it. So my, the bottom line for me is that cats are sentient feeling beings <clears throat> from dogs, just like one dog can be different from another. So we need to respect who they are as individuals respect their personalities, but also realize that cats can be highly social beings. We have a question, a couple of questions lined up already here. Pierce, uh, do you want to unmute yourself and ask your question? Oh, I'm so sorry. I thought I had unmuted myself. <laughs> can you, you hear have, me? Yeah, we can hear you. Does that mean I'm unmuted? Yep. Y yes. Okay. So Mark, um, thank you very much for this. I want to ask you what do you think or how you would distinguish among domesticated, feral, and wild dogs. Um, I'm interested in the, uh, amongst other things, in the different responsibilities that um, we, and obligations we have towards these three categories um, and what, what their respective rights might be. Well, it's good to finally meet you in person. <laughs> and you too, sir. sir. No, seriously, I love your work and you know I've interviewed you and written a lot about it. Um, so a home dog would be a dog who gets fairly predictable food, bed, vet care, but may, of course, be left alone all day at home in, in comfortable quarters, if you will, but still um, without any social interaction. Um, free ranging dogs or free roaming dogs um, could be dogs who have little to no contact with um, humans. Um, I've met many of them in Kenya, Tanzania, China, and India, um, and even in the mountains of Colorado. And then feral, of course, when you use the word really just, you know, the way it, it's meant is have no contact with humans at all. And I've actually, I had a student many years ago who studied feral dogs um, in the Southwest corner of Colorado that meets Arizona and New Mexico and um, Utah, for example. So that would be how I differentiate them. And, and the number I gave before about give or take 75% of these dogs being free ranging or feral. I mean, it's an approximation, but, but it accounts for around 750 million dogs. And because the, um, the latest estimate is there's a billion dogs in the world. What's really interesting in the studies that have been done is that the feral, some people say, well, dogs don't really form packs. They do, I've seen dog packs in the mountains. They do form packs and oftentimes they function like wolf packs. There are dominance relationships. There are hierarchies among the males and the females and between the males um, and the females. They hunt, they share food and they do all the things that if you will, their ancestors did. Um, I just did. They, they also respond a lot to signals such as pointing, they'll follow human pointing or gazing, um, just like a lot of lab dogs do who are tested, um, who have different, um, who are exposed, say, to different tasks. Um, they show the same ethogram, if you will, of behavior, the same kind of menu of behaviors. Um, and, and, and it's not surprising to me since I've met them. They're actually very social and they like people. Um, 
they don't necessarily bite or, or they're not necessarily more assertive or aggressive to people um, than our homed dogs. I don't know if that's getting to what you're looking for, Pierce. I, I don't know either, but uh, thank you very much. Um, I mean, I mean, what I find fascinating among them is their dogs. They're not wolves. Like in our book, A Dog's World, imagining the lives of dogs in a world without humans, you know, a lot of people said, well, I'll just go back to being wolves. And no, they won't. I mean, they're dogs. There's been enough changes among dogs during domestication that really um, means that they're, they're, they're a true, um, they're a true species, if you will. Dogs and wolves, I believe, are genetically identical. Um, yeah, or, or, or very close so. Yeah, I, I actually don't know the number, but, but very close. Yeah, there's anatomical differences. Um, like um, there's this <coughs> crest on the head of a wolf. It's called the sagittal crest, which is much larger than that, that of even large dogs. That's where the jaw muscles insert. And so it's not surprising that as active predators, their jaw musculature is, it's, is more highly um, developed for example. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, the, what I really like about your question too, about the evolution of sociality and who dogs are is, you know, dogs still have wolf genes in them and they still have some wolf engrams in their brain. That's the way I like to do it. So there's things floating around in them um, that are still very wolf-like. And so oftentimes people are very surprised I mean, I've had two cases actually this week, one from a person I know and one from I don't know, where an otherwise friendly dog started growling and lunged at. And I don't know if it was playful. I wasn't there, but bit through like a coat. And I don't know what that really means. I, do, I have no idea without knowing the context of how to deal with that. But dogs have wolf engrams in their brains. And, that, and that's one of the reasons why a lot of dogs who haven't had the opportunity to hunt or defend or acquire and defend territories will be able to do so on their own. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. Great. Um, Midge, are you up next? See if I can find yeah, you. Yeah, I'm there, but uh, it's actually Ed's question. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh. Um, I, I, was, I was wondering whether there are certain breeds which might be considered inappropriate, uh, either because, uh, you know, there've been attempts to, uh, outlaw certain breeds which are particularly aggr aggressive uh, and also there's some breeds that um, for example pugs that, that uh, have trouble breathing uh, mm -hmm. and and you know we sort of bred uh, all these problems that, some, something that's yeah. <laughs> appropriate um how you feel about that oh i'm i'm, I'm very much against it i mean you know i mean there's dogs out there and I'm not, I, I try to just get away from, you know, naming breeds. It turned out one of my favorite editors at a publishing company lived with these dogs and she didn't take it personally when I wrote in the book <laughs> how these dogs should be phased out. And I don't mean killed, you know, but we shouldn't be breeding them. You know, there's dogs who can't take exercise because they can't breathe. There's dogs who can't mate on their own, nor um, females who can't give birth on their own. Those dogs would disappear in a heartbeat, of course, when we disappear. I mean, that's part of our new book, you know, and, and I don't say it in a funny way. It's just, yeah, I mean, Darwin wrote about artificial selection and now, um, you know, a lot of people call it human selection. And that's part of the domestication syndrome is that humans take over the reproductive activities of different species. Um, I'm against, I'm, I'm really against it. You know, breeding other dogs, like, you know, there's working dogs who are quite happy. Um, you know, there's lots of different dogs, but I'm, I'm leery of what I call breedism um, saying that some dogs are innately um, or, you know, innately or inherently or genetically predisposed to behave in a certain way. Um, my the worst encounter I've ever had with a dog was with a beagle. And, <laughs> you know, and I love beagles and I studied them when I was a grad student. But it turned out I didn't know this, but you know, I saw this guy walking down the streets of Boulder with a beagle, the beagle's tail was wagging. I read the body language, I'm pretty good at doing that. 
And sort of I, I bent down and I just sort of put my hand under his muzzle. You don't go over the top and go good dog. And he lunged and he, he just missed a finger. Well, the guy apologized. I apologized because I knew I had really missed, missed I'd misstepped and I had invaded, uh, if you will, the dog's um, personal space. Turned out this dog had lived in a lab and was totally unsocialized for five years. The dog was doing totally appropriate behavior for who he was. Um, so I know there's problems that like a lot of towns have bans on dogs like pit bulls, malamutes and other animals. And, you know, I, I, I honestly don't know where to go with that. Um, sometimes the way in which a dog behaves is a total reflection of their humans. And I, once again, I don't mean that in a negative way, but a lot of love dogs I knew grew up in hippie families. Um, <laughs> I, I, I do a lot of work at the jail here and I work with homeless people and, you know, the rates of abuse among homeless, I mean, globally is very, very low among um, homeless people globally. So I don't know what to say. I think it's a great question. Um, but I, and, you know, it depends on this, you know, the statistics on dog bites and pit bull like animals. Um, so I'm not sure what to say. I, I um, but I, but I think we should stop breeding dogs who skeletally and anatomically can't breed, give birth or breathe. I, I, I do feel strongly about that. And I can tell you that I've gotten some X-rated emails about that claim. <laughs> Thank you for that. <laughs> um, Vance, it looks like you've got the next question. Let me get at a spotlight. There you go. Ready? I'm Sound ready. Audio check is good. <laughs> yes. Um, so invisible fences, good or bad? <laughs> you know, it once again, you know, it's it's just really funny. Um Having li I mean, I live in Boulder now because we had a big flood and I moved down, but I lived in the mountains of Bold in, uh, outside of Boulder for 40 years, way up in the town called Netherland. There were free ranging dogs and, you know, people used invisible fences. I, once again, I'm just going to say that the people I know who have used them, their dogs seemed quite normal to me. If you will, I ride my bike a lot. I'm a cyclist and I ride north of Boulder in some pretty isolated areas on dirt roads heading north. And there's a home there. It's got two beautiful dogs. And it dawned on me the second time I rode by there, the dogs will run at blazing speed and then skid to a stop at the top of the driveway. The, the invisible fence, I found out, I talked to the guy, isn't even there anymore. It was place learning. And I asked him about it and he said it took probably three trials. And I said, he said, he asked me the same question. Do you like them? And I went, well, you know, I trained my dogs in the mountains not to run away, not using them. But, you know, the trade-off really is quality of life too. I mean, the woman who used the shock collar once on her dog in a home near mine. I mean, I mean, I don't know where, how rural you are, but you know, there weren't any homes really that close to mine. I mean, she honestly used it once used it on herself. Her dog just seemed as normal as could be, but I was reprimanded by trainers who said that they could achieve the same result without using it. So that's where I leave off because I'm not a trainer. Um, the way I trained my dogs, including um, some who I rescued and about whom I knew nothing was, I'd go outside, I'd have, oh, I'd always have a treat or food in my right pocket. I would train them and I'd go, come, came, come. And they got to the point where they were always looking at me and it was right hand into pocket meant come. But the fact of the matter is, and, and I don't know how that worked I mean, I also train the neighbor dogs because all the dogs would come to my house because I give them treats and to en enrich their lives. I'd lay food out all over my land. I had a couple of acres. They'd spend 10 hours a day looking for a piece of food you know, that big. So I never used that kind of aversive. You know, I never used a fence, an invisible fence, nor a shock collar. 
I think maybe there's a degree of luck. Over the 35 years I lived there and all the dogs, that there was never a single um, injurious encounter between a dog and a cougar, a, a bobcat, a fox, a coyote, um, yeah, a fox or a coyote. I, I, I really appreciate these questions because I get pushed really badly on these. Um, but like I said, I've been told, I work with a woman in Boulder who has dealt with some of these cases and she's dealt with them very successfully, um, you know, without using an e-collar. So no, I appreciate these questions. I, um, the, the, yeah, anyway, yeah, okay. I don't okay. want to Thank you. Thank burn you. my candle. <laughs> <laughs> And it looks like Larissa is up next. Larissa, are you out there? Well, this isn't Larissa. This is Jeff, the husband, but uh, <laughs> Larissa's sitting next to me. Hi. Hi. Uh, this is a great little show. We're enjoying it a lot. Um, we had two kind of, we, we just got a, uh, um, a, a, a golden retriever last summer. And he's about 10 months old and he's huge and strong as a bull. And he likes to jump up a little bit. We're trying to train him not to do that. Any tips on that? But one thing that we've always dealt with, uh, we've had dogs over the years, and we've always not been sure about what types of tick preventatives uh, make the best sense. We lived in South Jersey. We're now in Maine. But the tick situation has been the same in both. You know, So there's the collar. There's the, you know, the oh. drop of stuff behind the head. And then there's the shot. So several of them kind of make a poison out of the dog uh, to kill the ticks. And, uh, you know, on the other hand, we've had dogs in South Jersey when we were there, um, you know, they were debilitated for a while until they were able to get a good dose of antibiotics to, mm -hmm. to clear them out. So mm -hmm. just thought, you know, maybe where you are, you've got, I don't know whether you have them out there in Colorado or not, but um, this part of the world, it's, it's bad. It's an issue. Yeah, there are ticks. And one of my former students is one of the leaders. Um, he studied, he, it's, a, it's a guy who studied the feral dogs, but there wasn't, you know, there weren't a lot of jobs in the 80s for feral dog researchers. He's actually one of the leaders in the demography and population biology of ticks. I've asked him this and he too says he, he, he doesn't know. I don't know. I mean, I, I, I really, I, I can't answer that question. Um, ticks and heartworm have basically migrated west so when i moved to boulder there were no cases of heartworm and i lived in st louis for years where it was pretty rampant i i can't answer your question um but okay. can but i want to make a comment about your golden retriever jumping um on people um my sister lives in rural vermont and two weeks ago she was walking down the street and uh, walking down a road with one of her friends a huge golden retriever came out, jumped on her friend, bit through her jacket. And thank goodness it was, you know, a typical gray, horrible, cold Vermont winter day. And she didn't pierce the skin, but her teeth, um, the, the dog's teeth um, basically indented the skin and there were bruises. So they got really upset. And the lady came out and said, oh, he's just playing. And my sister, who's a biologist also, but you know, who knows enough about dogs because she's had to listen to me for decades, said, what, what, you know, it's dangerous. And the lady said, well, I train my dog to jump on people. She's a therapist. And, and then of course they asked me what I thought. And I said, that was just utterly irresponsible. The reason I'm telling you this is I think, yes, the dog likely was playing, but there's kids running around those rural roads too. There's people who um, who are on the roads in the summit just wearing a t-shirt. I think from what I could judge from the wound, if that uh, woman had been wearing just a t-shirt, the dog would have ripped right into the muscles on her forearm. So I'm just telling you that. I'm not saying you're training your dog to jump, but she just came out and said, I train him to jump because my client, she's a psychotherapist, really like it. And I I didn't go on. I, there was a lot of things I could say, but I just kind of um, removed myself. Anyway, that was a sideshow, sir. Great. Uh, John Cotton, you're on next. Can you unmute? Uh, thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'd like to applaud as a CU alumnus, 
I applaud your background. It makes me a little bit homesick. When were you here? Uh, I was there back in, I graduated in 60. Oh, okay. I, I had a friend, John Cotton. I got here in 1974 and there was a guy named John Cotton who, um, who lived in Boulder and then moved. Well, I applaud your choice of college. <laughs> Thank you, Thank you sir. Uh, My question is that I've, I've um, been led to believe and, and, and generally practice the idea that dogs are pack animals. Uh, and therefore, particularly if they're to be left alone for any length of time, but, but even if they're not, that they're, they're best in pairs or with other dogs. And certainly Andrew <laughs> Cotter with Mabel and Olive have encouraged that. Uh, what is your thought? Yeah, it's a great question. I think it depends on the personality of the dogs. Um, most of the dogs with whom I lived and the dogs I've known, which is countless, um, you know, they're social animals. And when they get along with a friend, they form these really close bonds. I did um, rescue a Malamute and I didn't know much about her. She was a loner. <clears throat> she came to like us, but she was a loner. And over the years, I never felt that she felt comfortable with other dogs. I don't know why she needed her, you know, alone time. So what I tend to tell people, especially if I meet the dogs on a running trail or at a dog park, is let your dog tell you, you know, whether they want to be social. Um, I, I, I'm of the opinion that having two dogs is a lot easier than one, not because I can just dump them on one another, um, even if they don't like it. But when they form a, a bond or a friendship, it's really a tight one. Uh, and I, I think your question's good because I know people who work at the local humane society and I've worked with people at other shelters where um, if they get two dogs at once, they will never separate them. You know, they'll just, they'll hold on to them until someone comes <clears throat> who wants two dogs. So I'm, it's a, it's a really good question, but what I really like about the, what I like about that question is it really honors the fact that dogs are social animals and their common wolf progenitor, if you will, um, was a social animal. Thank you. Thank Wonder you. Wonderful. Colleen, let's see if I can find you. You're up next and it looks like you've unmuted. Yes, I already have. Um, okay, well, hello. Hello. Um, I, you may have just answered that the, my question with the question immediately preceding, but I was wondering if it's a good idea to bring in a new dog to a home where there is an older dog that's always been the only dog. <laughs> I mean, I, I've seen homes where the, the puppy or the new dog like it breathes new life into the old dog. Yeah. And I've also seen the old dog, a situation where the older dog is like, what in the world did you just bring this thing into my home for? I, I just don't know if there's a right or a wrong, or again, if it, if it boils down to personalities. Yeah, it's a great question. I just dealt with that recently. Um, my, one view, cause I've done that. Um, and my dogs had a life where they could get away from one another. And it was really clear that my old dog, who was sick um, and really on moribund, if you will, did not appreciate the young puppy. <laughs> never. I mean, never. He was pretty laid back. He was kind of a hippie dog and never attacked him and never did anything. It was really clear that he did not want this puppy around, but they could get away from one another you know, um, easily. And in my house, I could make sure that they were separate. I think they came to form this kind of relationship that, well, okay, I'll tolerate you, but, um, but I do think it depends on um, the personality of the dogs. I've heard stories where, you, like you just said, Colleen, a young dog comes in and really gives life, if you will, to an older dog. I've also heard a really bad, uh, well, it's a tragic story in the end, but um, where this happened and the old dog just really, I mean, I think it was a combination of the dog suffering from sundowners or some kind of cognitive decline. 
really folded in and 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 they finally had to give the young dog to a home. They asked me what I thought. And I said, well, if the dog is young enough and has been treated well, it's always hard to go to a new home. But I think that I think the young puppy will do well. And then the, the older dog never really bounced back. Um, the dog I'm talking about before who just really had her needed her downtime. She she just really liked being alone with us. I and I like I said, I wish I wish I knew more about her background, but we got her on the spur of the moment. And um, she liked us and she liked some people and she did not really like other dogs. So it kind of depends on the dog. And I, I really believe that. Yeah. But yeah. a good idea to provide space if there are two dogs in a home that are different, allow them to have personal space. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, like, like I said, I mean, my dogs, when they were outside, could avoid one another, um, but and even inside. But um, yeah, I, I, I mean, it's such a, you know, I always say the more I know about dogs, the more I say I don't know. So when specific questions come up, it's just hard to give an answer. I know people who would give you a carte blanche answer, either don't ever do it or always do it. And I, I, I'm not going to say that because dog personality is just like human personalities are very important to factor into these sorts of decisions. All right. Thank you. You bet. Thank you for your question. So I see the next question is the tick preventive, the preventative. I think you've answered that question already. Mm -hmm. We're almost at the top of the hour. Does anyone else have a questions? I have one short one. I do. I do, but I don't know how to get on chat. I don't know how to get my. Oh, just yeah. ask your question. I know, but well, okay. All right. Wait a minute. This, oh, sorry. I'm going to bring in my doggy. <laughs> <laughs> Who has a question? You or your dog? <laughs> you, you, you do need to be near your microphone, Ellen, though. <laughs> it's <laughs> great. Um, okay. Here we are. <laughs> Am I unmuted? Am I unmuted? Yeah, we can, we can hear you. All right. Uh, he's 17 years old. And um, he, he, he's almost blind, almost deaf, but he's prances and a little bit incontinent. So oh, hi. <laughs> the house is filled with pets. And sometimes he makes them, makes it to the bed. Um, I, I worry about his quality of life. He's, mm -hmm. He can't see, can hardly see, and can hardly hear. He certainly smells well. Yep. And he's in good spirits, and he's just loved enormously. Mm -hmm. And I'm certainly not going to put him down thinking of that or anything, but I do worry about, is, is he happy, which he seems to be? And the other thing, I have to tell you that every single day, I think about the end. Which is not yeah. not the right thing to do. I'd be I'd yeah. going to tear up now. Uh, so that's it. Well, I appreciate you, you're doing that. Um, I, I just had a friend who wrote me, you know, and she basically said yeah, she had an old dog, and it came to the point where she, she came to realize that you know they were keeping the dog alive for them, not the dog, but the dog. Even the dog sniffer didn't work, you know, and so you can enrich a dog's life by giving them a lot of diverse odors, the odors they like. Yeah. Um, you know, we all know dogs who go blind and can get around the house faster than I can and or can, <laughs> you know, go. I mean, seriously, there was a dog who was almost done blind on my um, road in the mountains and God, he could he could navigate the, the rocky cliffs better than I could. Um, but I think, you know, if she if she can walk a bit, let, you know, put her on a lead. You know, another big thing is, of course, the, the walk is for the dog. I yeah. hate seeing people go, come on, I got to go to Starbucks. We only have five minutes. The walk is for the dog. But olfactory enrichment is really important. Very and, important. And, and it's something that older dogs, you know, could, I mean, they could, they not only they could, they do really enjoy. Um, and if her sniff is working, because oftentimes 
the sniffer is the first thing that works in their life and it's the last thing that works. That's what I would do. Find odors. I mean, you, you, you clearly love her. Um, these kinds of situations are there. As we all know, they're just, they're unbelievably difficult. I've been through them countless times. Um, but I also feel in a non mystical way, if you will, that, that, that dogs and other animals tell you when they've had it. I really, I really feel that way. Um, one of my dogs just, he loved, ba- you know, he loved bagels and cream cheese. He loved bean and rice burritos, got to the point where he wasn't eating. He couldn't do a lot of things. And I really feel that when we made the decision that, you know, the, his quality of life was bad, that he was in some ways thanking us, but what's your dog's name? Willie E. Willie. Oh. See, he perked up when you said that. So Willie, if Willie, if your nose works, have your human guardian give you good, good, lots of odors. I mean, you may be surprised. I saw an old dog who just seemed pretty down and out, just get some new odors and had a new path through their house. So, yeah. But what, you know, what concerns me is I'm dwelling on the time that he will go. That what? I'm dwelling on the time that he will go. I'm dwelling on, you know, how many more days. Yeah, that's, I mean, I don't know you and I'm, I'm sure you're a love of a wonderful woman, but that's a human thing, not a dog thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> and I, and I, I don't, I don't mean that lightly at all, but it, it really is. I, I got obsessed with it on a, with a few dogs. And finally, my friend said, let it go. And I really, she didn't really mean it in a nasty way. She said, just, she said, let it go. Enjoy your dog while your dog is there. And a dog with a good sniffer is a good dog, a great dog. I really, I really, really believe that. I mean, he does tricks and he prances around and yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Great. Okay. We have one last question and we're going to have to finish up fairly quickly as we're at the top of the hour. Ruth Benedict, are you out there? Can you unmute? Or you could just ask the question. Yeah. Yeah, I was asking about dog houses. Yeah. I was brought up on a farm and we always had our dogs in a dog house outside because part of their job was being a watchdog. Mm-hmm. They would come in while we were awake and spend time with us by the fireplace, but at mm-hmm. night they were outside. Mm-hmm. Later when we tried to get a dog from a shelter, we told you can't have a dog if you're gonna keep it a dog house. <laughs> dog is a member of the family. Yeah. Um... And I said, well, yeah, but. We all worked on the farm. I mean, the dogs were with me when they went out herding the cows. Um, how do you feel about dog houses? Is this cruelty to animals? You got no, not necessarily. I had a big outdoor run that was bomb proof, line proof, you know, cougar proof, coyote proof. I mean, really, my dogs had a choice. I'd run them at night. I didn't have to worry about cars. I had to be very careful about, you know, predators. I'd run them at night. And they learned really rapidly. I'd go to the front door. If they went into the outdoor run, that's where they slept. They seemed as happy as a dog could be. Um, and if they came in the house, they came in the house. I think that the, I, mean, what, I love your question because it's kind of like a question of what, how should we treat our dogs? I think we should give dogs the, mo- the, the most freedoms, if you will, and the most choices we can have. They learned really fast. If they went to their dog house, sorry, if they came in the house, they went to sleep. If they went to the dog run, they were there all night. I wasn't getting up in the middle of the night. I mean, you know, there were times when they'd bark and I'd make sure that they were okay. Not, not sick. I wasn't worried about a predator. Um, give them a choice. But I, I, I love your example because a friend of mine, uh, some people around Boulder have gotten um, farm dogs and, there was this one dog who w- was social, loved people, loved other dogs, and at night would just walk out, nudge the door to the garage, and sleep on a doggy pillow in the garage. He's, he was just, and people, some people said, well, that's not good for him. What do you think? And I said, he's got a choice. He could go upstairs and sleep in bed or near the bed of his humans, or he can go into the garage. I don't think there's any general answer. So thank you for that. Um, I do, yeah. Great, Ed. Any last? Great. Yeah. Thank. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ruth. Um, 
Yeah, I think, uh, again, it, it sounds like dogs are kind of like people to me. You know, I, you know, they're, we're, we're all different and, uh, and we like, we like stimulus and, yep. uh, um, yeah. And, and it's, and it's it, it, one problem going back to shock collars, any form of correction is easy to overcorrect. And that's something yep. that we need, we need to be careful with. So yep. anyway, um, uh, maybe, maybe another time we'll get to talk about cougars and, uh, coyotes and, and, uh, sure. This is fun. I love, I love, I, I, thank you all for coming. I love thank you. I, I, thank yeah, you. you. You, yeah. You've got a bug out, I know. Thanks so much, Mark. Appreciate it. Okay, thank you. If you have any questions, Ed can give you my email. Send them on. But yeah, thank yeah. I, I, I love these homey things. I don't well, like formal academics anymore. So. And, and I encourage folks to go to your website. This was yeah. markhackoff.com. There's a lot of information there. So Great. Thank, well, thanks, thank you. Thanks so much. Thanks, thanks everyone you, for coming. Can you post the email on, on the chat board? It's just mark.beckoff at gmail.com. And Ed, could you send me the YouTube and other any other link? Because I know a lot of people would like to see this. Yeah, we'll have this up within a, a day or two, probably. And I'll send you the link when it's there. Great, thank you. Right, I've got to go. So yep. have a wonderful evening and yep, you love too. your dogs. You can't love a dog or spoil a dog enough. <laughs> thank you, Ed. Take care. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. While we're shutting down and stopping the recording and go feel free to leave. It's not rude. It's just going to take us a little while to get us straight here. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Well, Martha, can I close out of this uh, Zoom thing and still, still have the recording thing be processing? <laughs>